folks. Welcome to the Foundations of NPS NEPA Practice webinar series. My name is Kelly Daigle, and I'm a project manager with the Environmental Planning and Compliance Branch of the WASO Environmental Quality Division. If you were on the last webinar, you are probably familiar with my voice by now. I'll be facilitating and moderating today's webinar as well, which is the second in a three-part series during which EQD project managers will present foundational information on the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and current NPS practice for implementing NEPA. So we'll get started um, in a couple minutes. I see folks are still joining, but in the meantime, I'm gonna launch a couple polls um, and talk through those before we kind of dive into the meat of everything. So the first poll I'm gonna launch is, when did Congress pass NEPA? So if you are listening, if you're on, go ahead and respond. We'll see if you were paying attention in the first webinar. All right, looks like a good chunk of people have responded and most everybody got the answer right. So uh, Congress passed NEPA in 1969. Let's try another one. So this one is, who signs a finding of no significant impact for an environmental assessment or a record of decision for an environmental impact statement? All right, looks like we've got a lot of good answers coming in. I'm gonna share these poll result, results. Um, so most folks got this right, it's the regional director. So if you remember correctly, the superintendents are the ones that will sign categorical exclusions, and the regional directors are the signatories for both FONSIs and records of decision. All right, we'll do one more poll here before we jump in. And this one is, can you use more than one categorical exclusion to cover a proposed action? All right, good answers here. Quite a mix of responses. So the correct answer is no. Um, you cannot use more than one categorical exclusion to cover your proposed action. Um, keep that in mind, your action must fit squarely in one categorical exclusion. This is separate from if multiple CEs um, that have similar language could apply. I'm thinking about that A1 and B1, which is minor changes to a, an approved plan or minor changes to an approved action. Either one of those could work, but your action still needs to fit in one categorical exclusion. All right, so um, our first webinar, which was last week, we did a high level, high level overview of law regulations and policy. Uh, we talked about the concept of significance as it relates to preparing categorical exclusions, environmental assessments, or environmental impact statements. We talked about the basic NPS requirements and process steps for EAs and EISs. 
And we also talked about the process for preparing categorical exclusions. On today's webinar, we're going to go over the CE exercise that almost everybody completed uh, between last webinar and this one. We'll look at a high-level overview of NEPA streamlining efforts that are applicable to all federal agencies, and we'll take a deeper dive into Secretarial Order 3355 and the follow-on Deputy Secretary memos that are specific to Department of Interior. Um, this also includes the focus on page and time limits for EAs and EISs. And then lastly, we'll look at working with other agencies as a lead or a cooperating agency. And our last webinar, which is next week, uh, will provide a high-level overview of proposed actions and why they're important. And we'll take a deeper dive into, de into developing proposed actions and questions you should consider before starting a NEPA review. Um, as a reminder, all of our materials for these webinars are available on uh, the Google Drive. I'm going to chat out the link to this Google Drive. Please let me know if that works. Um, here you'll find reference materials, agendas, handouts, slides. Uh, we've also posted the recording of the first webinar there as well, and we'll post this one in addition to next week's once we get those closed captioned. As a reminder, um, you are in listen-only mode on this webinar. So in order to ask a question, please type them into the questions or chat box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we'll do our best to answer questions at the end of each major webinar section. Um, and as time allows, we also have an opportunity for an open Q&A session at the end of this webinar in addition to the one next week. And we'll do our best to respond to all the questions. Finally, after the webinar, um, the GoToWebinar program will prompt you to complete a survey. Uh, we really do hope you take a few minutes to complete this survey. We really value your feedback, and we take it seriously. Um, after each one of these trainings, we have meetings to talk about how we can improve the material, how we can improve the presentations. So please do your best to help us out and fill that out. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to have our presenters introduce themselves. Um, so we'll start with uh, Michelle. Hi, my name is Michelle Carter. I've been with the National Park Service since 2001. Um, August marks my year here with EQD. I'm very excited to be a part of the team. Um, but prior to coming with uh, to EQD, I spent my entire career in the National Capital Region, and I worked in natural resources management and also served as the Parks Compliance Officer. Hi, I'm Michael Edwards. I'm a project manager with EQD. I've worked with the Park Service um, for the Park Service since 2004, and um, I'm super excited about today's session. Thanks, you guys. All right, so uh, let's switch gears a little and talk about the CE exercise. So I pulled out three of the questions we asked you guys to address, um, and I pulled these out because I looked at everybody's answers, and these had quite a bit of variation um, in what people thought could apply in terms of a CE. Um, so as I'm going through these, I'll also offer, if you have any questions about any of the other 10 questions, um, please type those into the chat box and we can go through them. Like everything in NEPA, the answer often is it depends. So while we have kind of our, our best guess at what CE would be most applicable, it doesn't mean there are wrong answers. So as I walk through these, keep that in mind. So the first question that we'll talk about is number three. Um, this question was, your park receives many requests annually for special use permits for events such as weddings, photography, workshops, running events. Um, these activities are generally short-term and have minimal environmental disturbance. So most folks were able to identify what we believe to be um, a CE that could fit, which is 3.3 D4. Uh, this is issuance of permits for demonstrations, gatherings, ceremonies, concerts, arts, and craft shows. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people um, may not have identified is this is a really good use of a programmatic CE or a CE for ongoing or recurring actions. So if you know generally the site in your park where most of these events take place, um, you know there's a size limit, a time limit, 
Um, this is a great opportunity to use that programmatic CE, enter it into Pepsi, and then know that your NEPA compliance, um, you know, is done for each future event that meets, you know, the, the standards that you've set forth in that CE. Um, so most people got D4 right. I did also want to point out that this one is a great example of programmatic. The next one I'd like to talk about is number six. Um, this one is, you know, you have an existing EA for the South Key Sand Replacement Project. Um, the impacts of that project have already been analyzed, and your contractor is now using a pipeline to remove the materials as opposed to a dredge um, that will cross the beach and the near shore for approximately 2,900 feet. Uh, the impacts to the near shore and beach were covered in the park's EA, and the FONSI was signed 10 years ago. So what we've identified as a potential CE you could use is 3.3B1, which is changes or amendments to an approved plan when such changes would cause no or minimal environmental impact. Um, I had a lot of folks uh, in the responses discuss the need for a new EA, um, discuss the need for no NEPA documentation since a FONSI was signed. My recommendation here would be review the FONSI. It was signed 10 years ago, so ensure that the environmental conditions are the same um, and that the impact analysis is accurate. And then because the impacts are the same, essentially, um, we've already disclosed those. There doesn't, need, there doesn't seem to be any large variation in the type of impacts between a pipeline versus a dredge, um, you may be able to use a CE rather than doing a new EA. Um, so that's a good one to keep in mind. Again, with all of these, it depends. Um, we've done our best to try and give good examples, but if this is you know, a real world case, you'd want to definitely talk with your regional environmental coordinator um, and then determine your best path forward. And then the last one I wanted to highlight is number eight. Um, so this one, your park is proposing a new type of shuttle service. Um, it is experimental. Um, we, you want to test this new technology when the visitation levels are low. Um, we do know that this technology emits a high frequency noise and you don't have any studies on the effects to woodland birds. In addition, your park has a population of ESA listed woodland birds that breed in the spring months. So, when we looked at this, we thought this could be 3.3 C7, which is the establishment of a mass transit system not involving construction, experimental testing, or changes. So what I'll say about this is if you if you should if you're not going to use the CE, uh, or if you are going to use the CE, you need to look at extraordinary circumstances. So in this instance, this could have highly uncertain and potentially significant environmental effects, or it could involve unique or unknown environmental risks. Um, so because these extraordinary circumstances exist, this may be an instance where you'd want to move forward with an EA or an EIS. Um, like everything, we would suggest you consult with your regional environmental coordinator. Um, if you have any questions about NEPA pathway or if any of these extraordinary circumstances apply to your actions. So I see a couple questions in here. Um, let me dive in. So the first question is something broad like weddings um, can count as programmatic even though they are individual and unrelated events. Um, questions about the CEX. Um, I will point out a lot of you identified um, needing 106 consultation in some of these actions, which is excellent. Um, as you're going through these CEs, always keep in mind that Section 106 and Section 7 under the Endangered Species Act do still apply. Um, so you will need to complete consultation under those acts if you'll have adverse effects or may likely may likely to adversely affect an endangered species or critical habitat. All right, well, what I'll offer is um, if you have any questions, uh, if anything you know jumped out to you and you want to talk further about it, go ahead and send me an email um, and we can talk through those specifically. Oh, we've got one more question here. How do you deal with what could turn it over to Michael to talk about NEPA streamlining 
um, including Fact 41, EO 13807, and Secretarial Order 3355. Great, thanks so much, Kelly. Um, and sorry, can I minimize that? So um, yeah, for this session, um, we want to run through some recent streamlining initiatives that have occurred both throughout the federal government and specific to the Department of the Interior. Um, some of these are more likely to apply than others, but I want you to get a sense for the context in which some of the streamlining initiatives have occurred, um, why they're important, why we have to pay attention to them, and what they mean for you and your kind of your day-to-day -day NEPA practice. The first, um, and, and so specifically these are um, the FAST Act, Title 41 of the FAST Act, uh, Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, Executive Order 13807, and then Secretarial Order 3355 and the follow-on guidance that, that came from that. And then um, after we run through those, uh, Michelle will talk, talk to you about um, the roles of lead and, and cooperating agencies. The FAST Act, FAST 41 as it's known, um, it's a statute, so it was passed by Congress in 2015, signed into law by the President, and uh, the goal was to improve timeliness, predictability, and transparency for federal environmental review. Um, what folks were finding, especially on larger projects, was that the environmental review process just simply took too long. It could take five, 10 years before all the permits would line up and then something might be stale in your analysis and you would have to start over again. And so this was an initiative to basically force federal agencies to work together, be collaborative, and it established some pretty strict deadlines on not just NEPA, but all the associated permitting processes that went along with it. Um, what's unique about FAST 41 is that it only applies to NEPA projects, typically EISs, but it could cover EAs, um, that cost $200 million or more and for which there is a project applicant. So, even though there's going to be a lead federal agency, there's, there is a private applicant that is, that is asking to do something that, that essentially triggers NEPA through a federal agency action. And so, um, as you can imagine, the Park Service does not have a lot of projects that are triggered, I should say, has no projects that trigger FAST 41 where we're the lead agency. It's not inconceivable. Um, some of the larger infrastructure projects perhaps could, could reach that amount, but it's, it's very unlikely. However, we're concerned with FAST 41 because there are a number of projects that affect park units that are FAST projects. And so, as an example, there are transmission lines that pass through park units or close to park units, pipelines, energy lines, um, offshore wind, and, thing, and other things that either affect us directly in the sense that they're going to cross a park unit and we have to issue a permit or indirectly and that perhaps we can see them from our park or um, and they're going to create some sort of a, a viewshed impact or perhaps we have special expertise. And so really the key, the key thing to know for a FAST 41 project is that these are really high visibility projects that are super important to um, the administration, no matter the administration in power, um, they are, again, they're high visibility, and when we are involved in them, we have to meet some very, very um, strict timelines. And so, what, what does that mean in practice? Well, um, uh, it applies to a certain set of covered projects, and it means that we're going to consult early, we're part of a project plan, uh, basically, it's a document that is passed amongst the agencies that would cooperate or participate in the in the plan or issue a permit. Um, there are detailed review timetables, and there is public tracking on a federal permitting dashboard. So, 
um, essentially all the timelines that are required and agreed upon from the NEPA process to the permits are publicly available. So if you are um, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline Project and you want to log in and figure out if the Corps of Engineers, how close they are to issuing your 404 permit, you would just go to this website and it would tell you. And the expectation is, is that those dates are fixed. And if they are um, modified, um, there, there's a lot of angst that goes, that goes into that. Um, there's, uh, it establishes project-specific coordination and dispute resolution. And then um, the bottom line is that we have two years to complete the projects. And so while we're NPS is, is likely never to be a lead agency, um, a two-year timeline where NPS is the cooperating agency means that um, there's a lot of pressure on us to review information and provide comments, you know, in a professional and timely manner. And if I want to get out of this and just show an example of the dashboard, do I just hit escape? Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to show you um, an example or basically what the permitting dashboard looks like. So you can Google this, FAST 41 dashboard. Um, these are some of the projects that um, are ongoing. Um, Cardinal Hickory transmission line, that's one that affected um, the Ice Age uh, uh, historic trail. It's a, it's a very large transmission line. We commented on that. But as you can see, uh, it provides a lot of information, who you contact. Um, and then down below, it has a project timetable, um, where we're at, what things have been completed versus which things are in progress, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a public face facing dashboard. <clears throat> And then, sorry, Michelle, to get back to the, okay, thanks, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, then we have Executive Order 13807. And so this essentially came about, this was enacted under the Trump administration. Um, uh, essentially, uh, there was a, an analysis of FAST 41 and, and the administration said, you know, that's okay, but we want our own thing and we want to make it even uh, even broader and even more rigorous. And so uh, under this executive order, it's fairly broad, but what I want to focus on are the major infrastructure projects. And so major infrastructure projects um, are essentially a project to develop public and private physical assets designed to provide or support services to the general public and the following sectors. And, and if you listen closely, you'll get a sense for just how broad this is. Uh, surface transportation, including roadways, bridges, railroads, transit, aviation, ports, water resource projects, energy production and generation, including fossil, renewable, nuclear, and hydro resources, electricity transmission, broadband internet, pipeline, stormwater, and sewer infrastructure or drinking water infrastructure. So. While FAST 41 is unlikely to apply to us directly in the sense that there's the $200 million threshold, under the executive order, uh, there is no um, money threshold and there is no private applicant. Essentially, if, you're, um, if you have an EIS with two or more federal agency authorizations, and I'll talk about that in a sec, um, and, it, it, and it meets the definition, then it, then it applies. And so the department, routinely ask us for what EISs we think would meet the major infrastructure criteria. Um, another um, key part of the executive order is that it created the one federal decision process. And so the idea behind that is that um, all the agencies involved in the EIS that have um, some sort of a decision to make would be signing the record of decision. So in, in effect, if you were a cooperating agency with jurisdiction by law, um, and you were signing the rod, you would um, you would be doing so um, in most circumstances as a joint record of decision, a joint rod, um, and that's meant to speed up the process. Um, <clears throat> there's a similar timeline under the executive order 13807, um, two years, and so in effect that means one year nine months for nine months for the EIS and three months for the permitting process. Um, 
And again, on, on these projects, while the Park Service does not have a lot of EISs ongoing right now, it's entirely possible that we could have a major infrastructure EIS. Um, so the executive order does apply to us. Um, the executive order is also being um, um, read to apply to FAST 41 projects in the sense that they want FAST 41 projects to also use the one federal decision process. So there's a little bit of, of an overlap. Um, the last thing I'll say on, on these two um, broader streamlining initiatives is that FAST 41 is up for reauthorization, I believe, next year, which essentially means that Congress has to reauthorize this law for it to continue to be in effect. And there's been a lot of discussion about merging the executive order and FAST 41. So it's, it's entirely plausible that um, the portions of the executive order will, um, will end up being rolled into a broader law. Uh, we'll see how that works. Um, one last thing about the executive order that I want to stress that's a little bit different than FAST 41. Under FAST 41, where you need two federal agency authorizations as one of the criteria for it to apply, under the executive order, the Department of the Interior is now interpreting two federal agency authorizations to include yourself. So, in effect, if you're um, working on an EIS that triggers the executive order, that is, it's a major infrastructure project, um, and that means you're signing the ROD, that's one of two federal agency authorizations. The second federal agency authorization could be a Corps of Engineer uh, 404 permit or Section 7 consultation. Even if that consultation is informal and you're not going through formal consult and requiring a biological opinion and the like. So effectively what the Department of the Interior did through their guidance was they expanded the reach of the executive order so it could apply to even more situations for the Park Service. So for folks that are involved in, um, uh, for example, um, water projects, water delivery projects in a, in, a, in a big park, for example, that requires an EIS, it's entirely plausible that this executive order could apply to you. Um, and in these circumstances, we just recommend that you reach out to the, your regional environmental coordinator for more information. So those are two broad streamlining initiatives, but we've also um, been directed under the Secretarial Order 3355 for much more specific NEPA streamlining guidance that applies directly to um, all bureaus under the Department of the Interior. And these are things that um, affect us on a day-to-day -day basis, perhaps not on the EIS side currently because we don't have as many EISs, but certainly on the EA side. Um, the goal of the secretarial order was, is really similar to um, the broader streamlining efforts that I, that I just mentioned. Um, they, they're looking to find efficiency in the NEPA process. The feeling is that EAs and EISs take too long um, they, they take too long, there are too many pages, and they really hamper um, uh, informed decision making. And so the idea was to streamline. So what does that mean in practice? Well, um, the secretarial order and follow-on guidance established page and time limits for EAs and EISs, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. Um, it established a DOI NEPA tracking database, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute as well. So similar to the dashboard, but this one is just internal, but it tracks all projects um, that meet this criteria within DOI. It establishes an EIS clearance process. So there's always been an EIS clearance process in some way, shape, or form, um, but this time it's been formalized and guidance as, as to um, who you need to inform and who you need to ask permission to print an EIS. The cost of EIS has to be on the front cover of your document. So the cost to prepare the DEIS and the cost to prepare the FEIS is on the front cover um, in, in print that is um, large enough to, to be obvious. And then it requires solicitor involvement, Office of the Solicitor Involvement on all EISs and for EAs in certain circumstances. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. 
It also established other streamlining efforts. Um, it provided guidance on using pre-NOI time effectively. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. It called for new categorical exclusions. So uh, the Park Service is in the process of promulgating some additional categorical exclusions. It directed us to maintain a contemporaneous decision file. And what I mean by that is that um, when you're in an EPA process, um, you're creating a decision file. It's not the administrative record. That happens if there's litigation, but it's essentially a record of your decision-making process. And what the department is requiring is that you collect that, you generate that decision file in real time as you're working on the project. And then by the time you sign your um, record of decision or you're finding a no significant impact, your decision file should be complete. <clears throat> Uh, it created standardized procedures when lead and cooperating agencies or DOI bureaus. So in the past, um, we've, uh, anytime we were working with another DOI bureau on an EPA project, we would spend a lot of time crafting a unique project agreement with another DOI bureau. And what this did is standardize the process and said that you can no longer craft specific agreements. You're to use their guidance. And then there were other updates to NEPA guidance and policies. But the main ones that we want to focus on are the page and the time limits. And what does that mean for you? Because again, this is going to be kind of the bread and butter that, that, um, that, that you guys end up focusing on. So for EAs, um, what it recommends is that an EA should be no more than 10 to 40 pages. And it can go up to 75 pages, excluding appendices. Um, they must be completed within 180 days of the commencement date. So what does that mean in practice? What is the commencement date? Well, typically the commencement date for an environmental assessment begins with public scoping. Public scoping is not necessarily required. And in that case, um, it's plausible that you could begin it with internal scoping, probably more likely that you would begin it when you begin to draft the document in earnest but I think public scoping is probably the most useful um, date to use for commencement. There's one other date, and that is if a project applicant, a private applicant is applying for uh, permission to do something in the park, and that triggers NEPA, um, the date of the EA process starting would be the date on which you receive a completed application. So though there's guidance in uh, Director's Order 53 on permitting about what a completed application means and how that looks. But at a minimum, what we're requiring is that data needs are reasonably complete. So you couldn't have a completed application if you didn't have a meaningful, a proposed action that you could meaning, meaningfully evaluate. So what happens if you can't meet the page or time limits? Well, um, it goes up the food chain essentially. Uh, coordination is required with the Office of the Solicitor, the Regional Director, and the Director. So the Director of the National Park Service is being informed that you're late on your EA process. So this is kind of an unprecedented level of oversight and um, just gives you an idea of how important it is to meet page and timeline requirements. Um, again, if you can't meet the page or time limits, you're on the principles list. You have to enter the project into the DOI NEPA database. Um, where it begins to be officially tracked at the departmental level. Um, and then there's one other um, piece of guidance that was issued in March of 2019, which essentially said, hey, even if you're meeting page and time limits and you don't need to put it in the NEPA database, um, if your um, EA is a national, has national, multi-state, or statewide impact, if it could affect park resources or recreational opportunities, involve energy development or infrastructure or other DOI priorities. And that gives, for example, ungulate management, wildlife corridors, broadband, or um, telecommunications, then um, you need to identify um, that EA in the weekly report at least three weeks prior to the public comment process beginning. So there's a degree of coordination there if your EA triggers these things. So in reading through this list, um, it struck me, affect park resources, well, if you're doing an EA, you're admitting that park resources are affected in some way. Um, they're not significant impacts, you hope, but um, park resources are affected. So I, what I really read that to mean is that 
there was something unique about um, about this project. And I think in particular, if uh, a recreational opportunity is being affected, those are things that, that the department has seemed to care about quite a bit. So um, this is a, um, a table of the DOI recommended page budget for 75 page EAs. Um, and as you can see, um, there are, uh, it's pretty tight. Um, there's not a lot of room for extra stuff. And we'll talk about how we meet these page and time limits in just a moment. But first, let's talk a little bit about the EIS page and time limit goals. So it should be less than uh, or equal to 100, or I should say less than 150 pages, um, but up to 300 pages if it's unusually complex, excluding appendices. Um, and then this page limit also applies to all FAST 41 or one federal, H, one federal decision EISs if a DOI bureau is the lead bureau. And so, as I mentioned earlier, it's rare for the Park Service to be a lead agency on a FAST 41 project. It hasn't happened yet. Um, but it, it's, it, it's not um, implausible that we could be a lead agency on a one federal decision project. And so, even where there would be external um, agencies involved in that project, uh, let's say as a cooperating agency, if we were the lead agency, we would still be required to meet those DOI page limits. It must be completed in 12 months. That's uh, really, really quick for an EIS. So that means that you have to have a signed rod within one year after the NOI publishes. So we have a much more defined date for when that process begins with an EIS because it starts with the publication of the notice of intent. If it's a FAST 41 or a one federal agent or a one federal decision EIS, um, you still get two years. That's um, one caveat. So while you still have to meet the page limits, the timelines are a little bit different if it's one of those two broader streamlining initiatives that um, I talked about earlier. And then what happens if you can't meet the page and time limits? Um, uh, you need a waiver from the deputy secretary. So up above, I said it needs to be less than 150 pages, but up to 300 if unusually complex. However, the waiver process kicks in if it's more than 150 pages. And what does that require in practice? A detailed description and a justification and approval from the deputy secretary's office. And I'll say in practice, waivers are very rarely granted. Um, and I would say almost never if you're late due to circumstances that you could control. Uh, <clears throat> here's um, a table that shows the DOI recommended page budget for 150 page EISs. Similar to EAs, you can see that the, um, the suggested limits are pretty tight. Um, and uh, however, you can use the appendices to include um, various items that do not count against your page limit. So how do you meet these, these page limit goals? Well, probably the most important thing to do is you need to plan your NEPA document in advance. So we typically will start with an outline of our NEPA document and that outline should reflect minimum content requirements. So in the past, the NEPA document might wax eloquently about um, your park's enabling legislation and all the various laws that your park might have to follow, even if they're not directly related or implicated by your plan, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what we highly recommend is that you only include things that are actually required by law or regulation. And so if you go to the 2015 NPS NEPA handbook, there's a list under both the EA section and the EIS section for what are actually required in an EA or an EIS. And then other information you don't necessarily need to have in the body of your document. You can put it in an appendix, incorporate it by reference, um, which essentially means summarizing information that you got from somewhere else and just citing where you got the information from. You can make it available on a park website or Pepsi, include it in the decision file. So there's a lot of things, right, that go into a decision file that aren't gonna make it into your NEPA document, but still show that you considered certain, certain pieces of information. 
<clears throat> and then the last uh, bullet, prepare a draft plan that includes information not included in the NEPA document. So we're, um, historically, the Park Service has combined um, NEPA planning and NEPA documents. We're moving away from that uh, to some degree um, because plans can be quite a bit broader than just the NEPA aspect. Um, NEPA is triggered for actions that you can meaningfully evaluate that have the potential to significantly affect the human environment. And um, there are a lot of actions that parks take that simply don't trigger NEPA or that you could categorically exclude. Um, and a, a, a interpretive plans or um, strategic plans, things that are very important but that don't necessarily need to be in a NEPA document in an EA or an EIS. Uh, some additional recommendations for uh, meeting page limits. So some document drafting best practices, uh, again, Re just include the required EA and EIS content. Don't repeat information. Um, historically, it was very common for us to see alternatives repeated in the environmental consequences section. There really just isn't the, the, the space to do that sort of thing anymore. Um, make effective use of document layout, charts, graphs. Um, you may consider putting those in an appendix. Focus on the significant issues. So. Um, we'll talk about that more in the um, in-person training, but again, historically, NEPA documents, we would look at things that had minor impacts, and really what we want you to focus on are those issues that have the potential for significant impacts. Now, in an EA, you're eventually disproving that, right? You're saying that through our analysis, we found that these issues don't have significant effects, but early on, you're saying, is this an issue that has the potential? And if not, you're going to dismiss that, and you're not going to bring it into your analysis. And that dismissal um, can 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 go into your appendix, so that will save you um, uh, pay, pages. Discuss impacts in proportion to their importance. Use tiering and incorporation by reference techniques. And then um, finally, a hard look is not necessarily a long look. So a hard look is basic, basically a judicial standard where a court is is reviewing um, uh, the information that an agency used to make a decision, and it's saying, did they, did the agency really genuinely grapple with the, with the facts, um, did, or did they kind of superficially um, evaluate something and make a decision that seems rash? Well, you can prove that you took a hard look um, without um, uh, having a, having an extensive write-up in your NEPA document about that. And then meeting the timeline goals. So we just talked about how you meet page limit goals. Well, how do you meet the timeline goals? Um, what we're recommending is the use of preliminary project planning, pre-NEPA, to develop a proposal and assess NEPA readiness. So there's really some questions that you should ask yourself any time that you're going to begin an EA or an EIS process. The first one is, do you have a well-developed proposed action and necessary background information and data to prepare an EA or an EIS? So again, historically, the Park Service might begin a NEPA process and say, we're really not sure what we want to accomplish. Um, here's some ideas. And you know, this may be um, uh, a range of audits that we might consider, but we were reticent to identify a proposed action. Well, the regulations actually require that we identify a proposed action. There's nothing pre-decisional about that. And in fact, it helps show that, that our decision-making is ripe for NEPA. Have you developed a detailed schedule that considers all NEPA process steps and other compliance requirements? It can be um, sobering when you develop that schedule and lay it out and you place it over top of all other park responsibilities, um, especially parks that you know, receive high levels of visitation or are short staffed. And so that's you really, re re really analyzing whether now is the time to launch your NEPA process. There may be a better time to do it. Do you have adequate funding and staffing? And do you know who your stakeholders are and have you considered stakeholder outreach? So stakeholders can always throw you for a loop. Um, we've began to recommend civic engagement prior to beginning, beginning a NEPA process. So you can reach out to your public at any time 
You don't have to use NEPA to do that. In fact, we recommend that you don't. And that really gives you an idea of what your public's thinking and what your key stakeholders are thinking. And it can help you in developing your proposed action or perhaps um, make you realize that you don't have a proposed action or that now is not really the time to engage in this, in this NEPA process. So uh, earlier I mentioned that there's a DOI tracking database and an EIS clearance process. So I want us to show you the, um, <clears throat> what the tracking database looks like. So this is an internal database. Um, anyone within DOI can access it. Um, but uh, essentially, when you're creating a project, if you have an EIS, you're required to put it in. And again, you're required to put it in for an EA if you meet certain criteria or if you surpass page and time limit requirements. But <clears throat> there are multiple steps to it. And then um, you can see here are some of the projects that are being tracked. So the department pays attention to this. Every two weeks, they print out a spreadsheet and it basically is color coded and it shows what projects are in green and what projects are in red. And if you're a red project, uh, your regional director gets a phone call. So they're very, very serious about um, about meeting the page and time limit requirements. So the EIS clearance process um, has six steps. Um, basically for the major milestones, these are briefing steps that are required. I'm not gonna go into the details of these in part because we're starting to move away from EISs, we're not, um, certainly not initiating as many as we used to. We only have three active EISs within the Park Service right now, but it's fair to say if you are considering an EIS for a project, um, consult with your regional environmental coordinator. And then lastly, uh, uh, several regions have begun to um, uh, release their own internal guidance to implement the secretarial orders. And the guidance is essentially meant to ensure that uh, the regional offices are working with parks and that they understand park pro proposals that could tr trigger su substantial oversight and require RD approval. They're um, ensuring that you have the background studies and data um, and other information reasonable that those, those information needs are reasonably complete, complete, that there is a defined proposed action and that the park and the project have funding, can meet tight deadlines, and have a solid understanding of the briefing and clearance processes. And then uh, uh, there's um, uh, questions regarding whether civic engagement has been conducted, if that's appropriate, and also regarding solicitor involvement and, and DOI briefing. So essentially, um, not every region has released guidance, but I would say I think four or five regions have. I believe the Northeast region um, uh, is about to release guidance um, as well. So uh, pay attention to, to guidance that may be forthcoming for folks in the Northeast region. And then lastly, we just recommend consult with your regional environmental coordinator prior to initiating an EA or an EIS. They're very familiar with these requirements and they'll be able to kind of um, lead you through each process stepwise. So I'll leave it at that, and I guess I open up the floor to questions. Hey, thanks, Kelly, and thanks to all of you online and on the phone for hanging in there. We know there's a lot of slides and a lot of text, but we're trying to share as much foundational information as possible. NEPA is not easily described through cool pictures and interesting charts. But if folks have constructive feedback at the end of these sessions, we're all ears. Please take a few minutes to share your thoughts on the survey that will pop up at the end. I know that I am guilty of not responding to surveys, so <laughs> I just want to reiterate that we genuinely appreciate your input if you do have a couple of minutes after this. So, lead and cooperating agencies. These are terms used to describe the level of involvement other agencies have in the NEPA process. A lead agency is the federal agency that has the greatest level of involvement with the proposal and is responsible for preparing the environmental analysis, making sure that it's accurate and complete. 
In some cases, it may make sense to have two lead agencies, which we'll talk about a little bit more at the end of this session. A cooperating agency can be federal or non-federal, the agency that has jurisdiction over the proposal or one that has expertise with respect to the impacts connected to the proposal. An example of a cooperating agency that came from a, manage, a project that was managed in our office is the Olympic National Park Mountain Goat Management Plan in Washington State. The plan proposed to transloc translocate non-native mountain goats from National Park Service land to U.S. Forest Service land in the Cascades. Since the Forest Service had jurisdiction over the receiving property, they were a cooperating agency. A random fun fact is that from 2012 to 2014, approximately half of the National Park Service EISs actually had cooperating agencies. When we refer to special expertise, we're referring to statutory responsibility, agency mission, or related program experience. Example of uh, special expertise comes from Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, it was the Drake's Bay Oyster Company special use special use permit environmental assessment environmental impact statement. The National Park Service needed to make a decision on whether to reissue the SUP for the company to continue operating the commercial shellfish operation in Drake's Estero. <clears throat> Here, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and NIMPS, the National Marine Fisheries Service, were cooperating agencies due to their expertise related to listed species. The California Department of Fish and Game was also a cooperating agency because of their expertise in issuing and managing aquaculture leases. Oftentimes, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is a cooperating agency on our plans because they have special expertise related to ESA introductions. A cooperating agency relationship is one that is established between eligible governmental entities as defined by DOI regs. These entities can include federal, state, tribal, or local organizations. The relationships can be established two ways. The lead agency can extend an invitation. This is optional on EAs, but it's required for EISs. The action to extend the invite can come from a park superintendent, but the action to accept or reject the invite must come from the regional director because it requires the commitment of resources, whether it's staff time, funds for travel, et cetera. If an agency believes they're eligible to be a cooperator, but they've not received an invite, they can put in a request to be added. This, of course, applies to the National Park Service. However, as with accepting or rejecting invitations, you should coordinate with your regional office before submitting this request. A lead agency must consider any request by an eligible government entity to become a cooperating agency during the preparation of an EIS. And if a lead agency denies the request to become a cooperating agency or determines it's inappropriate to invite an eligible agency to be a cooperator, the lead agency must state the reasons for their denial or the decision to not extend the invitation in their EIS. If another agency's actions could affect National Park Service resources, we should consider becoming a cooperating agency. And if we have jurisdiction by law over the proposal, we are required to participate. The relationships can be established and formalized, as Michael alluded to earlier, through a MOU or a Memoranda of Understanding. This um, this process is encouraged by CEQ, the Center for Environmental Quality, and it's actually required by DOI regs if it's a non-federal agency that is a cooperator. Uh, in that case, the MOU must include a commitment for the cooperator to ma maintain confidentiality of documents and deliberations prior to the release of the NEPA document to the public. You can find more information about this on pages 74 to 76 of the NEPA handbook. Again, as Michael mentioned earlier, standardized intra-department procedures were introduced in the June 11, 2018 DEPSEC memo, which outlined procedures for replacing those individual MOUs for agencies that are within the same bureau functioning as cooperating agencies on the same plan. In the memo, it addresses roles and responsibilities of the lead or the cooperating agency, the dispute processes for dispute resolution, processes for communication, the SO or Secretarial Order 3355 timelines, schedules, and document page counts, and also concurrent reviews. 
The responsibilities of a cooperating agency apply to both cooperators on our NEPA reviews and to us as we are cooperators on other agencies' NEPA reviews. To be an effective cooperator, one must engage early. The advantage of this is that in many cases, as a cooperating agency, you're able to offer substantial input on internal draft documents before they go to the public, which enhances the credibility of our comments on the documents as they are developed later. It allow, also allows us to get a head start on addressing those issues that are related to our jurisdiction and our special expertise. As a cooperating agency, one may be asked to develop analysis and review portions of the NEPA document, and they may contribute by helping with identification of environmental issues, alternatives development, compilation and analysis of data, and impact analysis. And what's interesting is that lead agencies may only ask a cooperator for input on a subset of issues <clears throat> related to their expertise or jurisdiction. It's important to note that the lead agency does not have to accept the National Park Service comments or address NPS issues. It's up to them as to whether or not they want to do so. However, if we are expected to adopt the document under one federal decision, for example, if we're issuing the right-of-way permit for a transmission line or a gas line, we have to make sure that for those lands that we have jurisdiction over by law, that our issues are addressed in the EIS with sufficient detail to meet our needs. The National Park Service is a cooperator, or comments on the comments on the documents should actually go to the lead agency, not through the DOI external review process. Um, I know that maybe that means something more to some of you than others, but the point there is just to make sure that the comments go directly to the lead agency preparing the document. And finally, to wrap up here, We'll touch on joint lead agencies, which is a relationship that we actually kind of advise that you use sparingly, which we'll talk about here. So in cases where more than one federal agency is involved in the same proposal, a single NEPA document should be prepared. Uh, but in most cases, one of the agencies will be designated as the lead agency, with others involved as cooperators. For NPS-initiated actions, we're the lead agency for the NEPA review, except for rare circumstances when there's a compelling re reason for another agency to be the joint lead. An example of this comes from another project led by our office. It was the North Cascades Grizzly Bear Restoration Plan in Washington State, it was re proposing to reintroduce grizzlies into their historic range. Here, the Fish and, Wild, uh, Forest, Fish and Wildlife Service had jurisdiction over the action to the proposed action to uh, reintroduce a federally endangered species within a recovery zone, and the National Park Service had jurisdiction over the land where the proposed action was to occur. Pros of this structure is that all the key players were at the table for the entirety of the project. It created a high level of commitment from both of the agencies. The cons were that you had two agencies' processes to work through, and we all know the larger groups require a lot of extra coordination. The team had to figure out who was responsible for the Federal Register Notice, how the ROD, the Record of Decision, was going to be signed, how to brief management in both agencies, which was and still is a very time-consuming process. So if you are in a situation where a joint lead agency relationship is established, DOI regulations require that one agency is identified as the agency responsible for filing the EIS with EPA. All right, so just a really important question here. What do you call a grizzly bear with no teeth? Please enter your answers into the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have one correct answer. <laughs> Whoa, there, we got some good answers. Gummy bear, good for you guys. We also have old and still frightening. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you all for humoring me with my cheesy jokes. <laughs> all right, so last, uh, back to the last important bullet here on the slide. <clears throat> Non-federal agencies can also be joint lead agencies, but it's only when they have an action to approve that's connected to our action or the other agency proposal, and when they have their own state or local requirements that they have to comply with that are comparable to NEPA. So an example, a few years back at Yellowstone, the state of Montana was a joint lead 
uh, on a bison management plan because they had to decide how to manage bison outside of the park, which was for them a decision that was subject to the Mo Montana Environmental Policy Act process. So with that being said, that's all I have on cooperating agency. And Kelly, I guess we'll take it back to you for questions. Yeah, that sounds great, thanks. Okay, so the first question is, is it mandatory that all cooperating agencies' names are on the EIS document, and do all agencies write their own records of decision? 